Hello and welcome to the Back Porch and to another session of Back Porch Forestry. I'm Dr. David Merker, Extension Forester with the University of Tennessee. Back Porch Forestry includes a series of 30-30s, roughly 30 slides in 30 minutes. They're not overly detailed, instead offering general education on the topic of trees and forests and forest management. The intended audience is private forest landowners, although others might find this information inf uh, interesting and perhaps even useful. At the conclusion, you'll find a participant survey and I encourage you to take part in that. Your feedback does matter. So kick back on your porch and enjoy this session of Back Porch Forestry. Give me a moment to uh, share the screen and we'll get started. Back Porch Forestry. Today's session is on tree physiology. Specifically, I was asked the question a number of years ago and had a little difficulty answering this, but somebody asked, why do trees die? Why do trees die? And to understand how or why trees die, we must, must first understand the process by which they live. And so we're going to have an introduction of tree physiology, the process by which trees live. So I want to begin with just some general concepts of, of tree parts. If we begin at the very top, you see the word terminal. That's the lead branch, the leading branch of a tree, the tip top, if you will. Coming down the right side, you'll see, you'll see some words scrambled together that say live crown length. I like to think of that instead as live crown ratio, but it's, it's that portion of total tree height that has living branches on it. So a healthy, healthier tree generally will have a, a higher live crown ratio. Coming down below the, the, the surface then, um, below the soil level, you'll see diff three, different, three different types of roots. There's a tap root that anchors the tree, lateral roots extend outward, and from these lateral roots spring forward root fans. Root fans are very important because those tiny uh, root, root fair, fans or hair-like roots are the ones that procure the, the moisture and the nutrients and the oxygen uh, to help the tree function. And so uh, and coming around on, on, on the far side, you'll see the trunk or the bowl, sometimes called the stem of the tree. Um, this is very important to foresters and to the forest industry because this is where we get our wood products from, this section right here. And then we have the lateral branches as well. So a few things to consider. Um, trees expand really in three different directions, three different areas, uh, three, three different points of expansion. And the first is root tips. And so although we can't see it, roots are expanding outward and downward on a regular basis. But, but the tree also grows on the tip of its crown as well. And so that would be the terminal bud and the axillary bud or lateral bud. And they, these are constantly going out and, and trying to find new sources of sunlight um, to help the tree grow. And then, and then finally, the tree of course expands in girth too. Uh, the cambium expands each year. And so let me show you what I mean by that. You see the word cambium. Cambium is located below the, beneath the bark. Uh, and each year through mitosis, it produces two different types of cells. It produces xylem, which is new wood. And the function of the xylem is to carry water and nutrients up uh, to the rest of the tree so that uh, these, these um, processes can, can, can function. That's the xylem. We think of xylem because it's going up. We say xy high. Cambium also produces phloem. Phloem is new bark. And the function of phloem is to carry the, the the nutrient, the sugar that's produced in the crown of the tree down to the rest of the tree. So we remember that as flow low, xi high and flow low. Well, as xylem ages, it becomes old wood or heartwood, and as phloem ages, it becomes bark. So keep that in mind as, as we progress. Here's a picture that, that I borrowed from, from Alex Shigo. Um, this tree was wounded. You can see the wound on it. Something to realize that trees, trees never really heal when they're wounded. What trees do is they hide their problems, they hide their wounds. And so you can see where the wound occurred and then by year one, it was beginning to grow over. Year two, you see these annual growth rings. Year three, year four, by year five, it finally, that wound finally seals off, but it will always be with the tree. And by year six, the wound is just a bump on a log. So to understand how trees die, we must first understand the process by which they grow. And so we examine the branch of science that explains the, 
function of living organisms and their parts. And that's known, of course, as physiology. So the major physiological process, processes in a tree include the following, and they all have four or five syllables, but bear with me. Photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration, and translocation. And very simply, we're going to address each of these four processes today so that, that you can understand how trees grow a, a little more clearly. And we begin with, with photosynthesis. We all remember what photosynthesis is. You learned that in grade school, or high school um, biology. It's simply the conversion of the sun's energy. The plant, in this case the tree, converts the sun energy into food. That food is sugar, and more specifically, it's the carbohydrate molecule. And even more specifically, it looks like this, C6H12O6. Now, a point I want to make is that people oftentimes will tell me that, that they have fed their tree, they, they went out and fed their tree. What, what they mean to say is that they fertilized their tree. We can't feed a tree, a tree feeds itself, it produces its own energy. But the things that we, can, that we do to or around the tree can help it produce food, or in many cases, be a detriment to that process. So photosynthesis produces this sugar, this carbohydrate molecule. Now. The window of opportunity I'm talking about for hardwood trees, these, these are the deciduous trees. The window of opportunity for those trees to produce carbohydrates is really very short. It must be done in only about five months out of the year. And even during that time, only about six or eight hours a day because no photosynthesis occurs at night. And there's no sunlight, so it can't photosynthesize. And when it gets really, really hot outside, photosynthesis shuts down because the loss of, loss of water is so great that the tree can't afford to lose any more water in this process, so it shuts down. So six to eight hours a day, only about five months out of the year, it better be very, very, very good at, at creating food because it has to do it in a thousand hours out of a year when there are 8,700 plus hours in a year to do it. So the daily uh, carbohydrate production, this is just a relative graph that kind of gives you a general idea of what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. The rate of photosynthesis increases to a point as temperature increases. So the spring of the year, boy, it get, kicks in in early summer, but, but then um, as temperatures get too high, whether it be during an entire month or during just certain times of the day, this photosynthesis rate crashes and, uh, and affects the amount of food that a, that a tree can produce. Looked at another way, seasonally, this is the carbohydrate production. It occurs, generally speaking, this, this time of the year with nothing occurring in the winter months. So again, carbohydrate produced in the summer must carry the tree for the entire 12 months uh, because even in the wintertime, the tree is using up this stored sugar. So here's a seasonal pattern. What we've got here are the five seasons of the year. Let that sink in a second. The five seasons of the year. And the darker the tree, the more sugar it, it has, more sugar it has stored. And so we would expect season number four is late summer. So at the end of the growing season, you would expect the tree to be pretty plush with energy. A lot of sugar stored up because during the winter time, it has to then use that, that energy. And during the winter time, what happens is these carbohydrates are pulled down and stored in the roots uh, in the trunk and in the buds as well. And just the tree more or less just kind of survives through the winter. Then in early spring, what happens is, is if you look at number one there, the carbohydrates now are being pulled upward to the branches. Why? To prepare for leaf emergence. It takes a lot of energy to flush leaves and to, to, to refoliate itself. And so you would expect that, but you would also expect that by the time spring is in, in, in full force, after leaf emergence has occurred, the carbs have been depleted. So it's used up its energy, and the tree isn't yet perhaps photosynthesized, and at least not to the rate that it could because it's still kind of cool. So the last thing we want then during spring, particularly if you have an early spring, is you don't want a late frost that kills the leaves. Every 10, 20 years or so, you'll see something widespread like that around the region, and the trees will defoliate. And so then they have to call upon depleted energy reserves to try to flush again using um, dormant buds that they, they hold in storage. 
And so it can be a critical time for a tree if something bad happens. And then by midsummer, the tree is replenishing its depleted carbohydrates. So that's kind of how it, how it works. Might help you understand this process a little bit better. So if photosynthesis is the process that produces the carbohydrate, then respiration is the process that breaks it back down. So they produce their own food, but that means they also use their own food as well. And so respiration then is the oxidation or the using up of carbohydrates. Why? To provide energy to keep those cells alive, to fuel tree growth, respiration. And so respiration, if you were to look at it um, uh, in a chemical equation, is nothing more than photosynthesis in reverse order. It builds the molecule up, then it breaks the molecule back down. Photosynthesis, respiration. I kind of like to think of respiration. Periodically, I'll personify a tree, give them human characteristics. Think of respiration kind of equivalent to our digestion of food. So photosynthesis is seasonal. We've already established that. It, it, it occurs roughly over about a thousand hours per year, but respiration occurs all year long. So as you might expect, um, the rate of photosynthesis must exceed the rate of respiration because without a surplus of carbohydrates, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a deficit of energy and then the tree vigor is going to decline and eventually tree mortality will occur. It's no different than us. We can't starve ourselves. Trees can't be starved of energy either. So a few points to ponder then. We must minimize all the activities that could hinder carbohydrate production. So I'm here, I'm generally referring to yard tree maintenance and so forth. We must minimize all activities that could hinder carbohydrate production. And what, what are those things? What are the things that we should avoid around trees? Well, we don't want to remove healthy photosynthesizing limbs, particularly during the growing season. That's what most people do though. They can't mow underneath their tree anymore, so they start hacking limbs off, you know, in the spring or, or, or summer. And that's exactly what you don't want to do. Pruning should occur in late winter. I like to think January, February, maybe through about early March is all. That's when we want to prune our trees. We also want to, don't want to damage the cambium of a tree because we know that water has to come up through that area. Um, uh, energy has to come down through that area. And so we want to avoid uh, weed eater damage or damage from equipment or mowers or things like that. Soil compaction falls into that. We've mentioned those fine roots already, uh, but, but compacted soil will hinder that fine root development. Tiny roots can't penetrate um, soil that's heavy to clay or just has been compacted with equipment. So if you're building, try to avoid driving underneath trees and around trees. Put a barrier around them and, so that the equipment will come in and, and miss that area. And then finally, we don't want to damage the root system either. We'll, oftentimes people will bury a water line or a cable or something like that, not thinking that they might be harming the tree, but you can ha harm the tree in a, in a great sense if you do that. So let's look at a profile of the roots. What we've got is a top view and a side view. And um, it's the same view, of the, the same stump essentially, but I want you specifically to look at these root fans. So these right here, those tiny roots right there, but if you look at it from the side profile, you'll see how they are merging and, and they grow toward the surface. And the reason is because that's where the water and the nutrients often are, and even the oxygen that, that, that the roots might need for respiration, that's where that can be found. And so what we typically do in yard settings is we come in and throw a little mulch around the base of a tree and Again, I'm personifying a tree, but I think a tree looks down at that and says, what good did that do, really? Uh, if the root fans are clear out here, all we've done is maybe is protected the tree from weed eater blight, but we really haven't helped the, the, the environment with the roots. So I guess what I'm saying is that in yard settings, if we're going to mulch, let's mulch. Let's do some good. Now, that might look a little bit ridiculous, but consider this. How much of the forest is mulched? It's all mulched. And so um, if you think about it, fallen leaves and um, branches and so forth are all over the forest floor. So forests like that, mulch is a good thing. It conserves moisture. It also softens up that soil, allows the roots to penetrate the soil a little bit better. And so um, start a trend in your neighborhood and begin mulching a little bit wider. You might be saying, well, who would do that? Well, I actually did that in a house that we lived in um, probably 15 years ago, these trees were already planted and I could see they had Bermuda grass planted 
right up to the edge of the tree. And I knew that in the long run, the tree wouldn't like that. And so I deadened the grass, created a ring, uh, and then came in and mulched the area and planted some, some desirable things up underneath it, uh, pink dogwoods and um, hostas and so forth. And uh, every year or two then, I would come back and actually expand this, expand it by a foot or a foot and a half. And the trees loved it. You can see how big they are here. And that was just uh, about three years worth of growth between these two, those two pictures. Trees like mulch. So let's look at the third physiological process and that's transpiration, which is the process of water passing from the tree back into the atmosphere. And this occurs mostly through the stomas in the leaves, pores in the leaves. And so small pores exist in the leaves. They are called stomas and they open and they close and regulate gas exchange and water movement and thus tree growth. And so here's an example of a stoma that's open. So when photosynthesis in, is in full force and the tree is really generating or creating a lot of sugar, you would expect the stoma to be open and water is being released through this, uh, this open stoma. But when the temperature gets hot or at nighttime, the stoma will close to prevent the loss of water as an effort to try to conserve the water. Uh, for a later another time. So the mechanism of water movement in a tree, um, essentially it moves from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So as leaf cells dry then, they pull additional water from below. And transpiration rate then depends on the following. So you would expect low humidity, high winds and high temperature to increase the rate. And so a tree might close the stomas if it senses low humidity or high wind or high temperature. And it might prefer to carry out its photosynthesis uh, in mid-morning or, or later in, in the day after things have begun to cool down and maybe the winds died down. So carbohydrates are produced in the leaves. We understand that. Uh, and then they are transported uh, to the stem and to the trunks and to the roots via the phloem cells for use. So that seems to be pretty clear. But you might not fully understand it is um, the process of translocation. How do they get there? How do they get about? And that's translocation. So that's the, the piping system that distributes the food around in the tree. And through translocation then, this, this sugar, this carbohydrates, um, it supports five different processes in a priority order. So let's spend some time on this. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, the sugar has been produced, now what gets it first? So you, you might expect that the maintenance of living tissue is most important. In other words, the tree has to keep its living cells alive before it can do anything else. We're the same way as humans, right? And so that's that respiration we're talking about. It feeds the living cells through respiration. Now, if there's any sugar left over, any carbohydrates left over, the tree then directs it to the production of fine roots. That's those root fans, those tiny root roots we were talking about. Those are very important because, like I said, their job is to procure moisture and nutrients and, and, um, uh, and, and, and essentially so that the rest of the tree can survive and thrive. Now, if there's any sugar left over after all that, the tree sends it into flower and seed production. So as you can probably imagine, it takes a lot of energy to create a flower. And likewise, it takes a lot of energy for the fruit, whatever that fruit might be, an acorn, uh, a hickory nut, um, for that matter, a coconut. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to produce that fruit. A food. And if you ask most self-respecting deer and turkey why they eat acorns, because that's where the food is. And so a lot of energy goes into that. That's third in line. Now, if there's any sugar left over after that, it goes into what we call primary growth. And this is the elongation of the branches and the roots. So essentially what the tree is saying is, okay, I've taken care of number one, number two, number three. Life's pretty good. I can now afford to go out and, and find a new piece of sky or find a new piece of earth down here. So they expand outward. That's what makes the crown of the tree wider and the, brand, and, and the roots longer and so forth. And so uh, think of it this way, if, if those, rare times when you might have got a raise and you're trying to decide what are we gonna do with this money now? 
And that's kind of where a tree, tree is at this point. Everything's taken care of. It's gotten a raise. It has extra energy. What can we do with it? And so it goes to primary growth. Now, if there's any um, sugar left over after all that, it finally gets down to what I as a forester am interested in, and that's secondary growth. So that's growth in diameter. So think of that as growth in, in, in the girth of the trunk, in diameter of the trunk, the wood in other words. And so what most people see is the growth ring. We talk about the annual growth ring and you've counted the rings on a stump to determine how, age, how old the tree is. Maybe you've noticed some of the rings are closer together and some are farther apart. As a forester, I don't think of those as growth rings. I think of that as interest rates. And so we've got an asset and then each year we're putting on additional growth onto that asset. And so only after all these processes have been um, satisfied, does energy finally reach the trunk of the tree to expand in, in diameter. So um, in other words, if we're trying to grow wood fast, trees fast for a growing society, we need to make sure that these first four are already in line and, and take place. Because in a healthy tree, each of these processes is sufficiently fueled. Again, life is plush if all five of them are receiving the energy. But gradual mortality of a tree can be observed by examining these five processes in reverse order. In other words, a carbohydrate recall. So in other words, as a forester, I might come out and, and bore into the tree, and if I begin to see the growth ring shrinking, 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 that's telling me the tree is in decline. And then you look at the end of the branches and you see, oh, it's not expanding in length anymore. And so pretty soon that means that the flower and fruit production is gonna start declining. And unless we do something, the trees probably will eventually, will eventually die. So think of it this way, kind of uh, what I'm referring to as the carbohydrate balance. Photosynthesis produces the carbohydrate, respiration uses it up. And so you, you hope that the, the amount of carbohydrates produced in photosynthesis will exceed the rate that's being used up in respiration. That means life is pretty plush for the tree. But when this begins to balance out, say, midlife in the tree, or because the tree has experienced maybe some increased competition from an adjacent tree, this balance uh, equals until such time that it, it inverts. And the amount of sugar that's being used up through respiration exceeds photosynthesis that can't continue, and eventually the tree will starve and die. And this is very common with, with really old trees that there's just no hope. There's a point where you can't, you can't turn those trees around, not without perhaps spending a lot of money. Or, and even then it oftentimes won't work. But tree mortality, I sort of describe this as a gradual energy losing process. Of course, it doesn't always happen that way. Mortality can also occur rapidly through some type of mechanical disruption. And so I've got some examples here. You see this upper picture is actually a situation where we intentionally killed the tree. We have severed the cambium. And you might say, why would you want to do that? Well, in a yard setting, you probably wouldn't want to do that, but in a forest setting, you might. And so the forest overproduces trees in, in many cases, more than what we need. And so trees compete with each other for all the elements. And They'll do it on their own, compete on their own, and some will win and some will lose, some will die. But maybe the ones that survive aren't the ones that you want to survive. And so foresters actually come in and deaden trees that are impacting the growth of the, of the more desirable ones. So an example might be if we're trying to grow good quality oak, but that oak tree is being outcompeted by perhaps a hollow tree or a much lower value tree, we might kill that lower value tree in order for that growth to be shifted over to the desirable tree. So that can happen pretty quickly. Also, trees can die very rapidly if there's root damage. The trenching, things like this can kill a tree uh, pretty rapidly. And then also just storm damage. When a tree loses limbs, particularly larger trees, and they lose limbs during the growing season, um, they can die pretty quickly. So it, it's a process that can be slow or fast tree mortality. So we kind of get back to or down to what the original question was, why do trees die? And really they die because respiration stops and respiration stops because carbohydrate production stops and carbohydrate production stops because photosynthesis stops. And photosynthesis stops because of any number of factors can cause a tree to stop photosynthesizing. These are the, the, um, 
the variables that go into photosynthesis and that's sunlight, water, nutrients, temperature, carbon dioxide, and, 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 and oxygen. And, and these are the things, if any one of these uh, are taken away from the equation, the tree will die. But as you look at that, it's probably not likely that CO2 or O2 are gonna be a limiting factor. Rarely are nutrients truly limiting. And temperature normally is not a concern unless it's like a, a you know, a tree that was taken out of its natural environment and moved to a climate that it's not used to. Really what it boils down to is sunlight and water. Um, sunlight normally is not limiting either unless the tree maybe was planted when it was young and it became overtopped by another tree or a building was constructed and, and it took away the sunlight. More often than not, it's going to be the water. That's what ends up killing trees in yard settings is the lack of water. So here are the top seven reasons uh, why I see trees dying, particularly in yard settings. Uh, I'm just calling them collectively a disturbance. So a drought certainly will kill trees. They might grow well for a while and then you'll have a severe drought. Um, soil compaction, we've stressed that already. Roots can't penetrate compacted soil. A lot of our housing subdivisions were, were built on areas that um, there were once row crop fields and maybe the soil's compacted. Just poor species selection. In other words, you've gone to a nursery and you've picked up a tree because you thought it would be good on your property when in fact it's not suitable for that type of soil. And I think of trees that, that perform better in, in, in areas where, where it's typically wet and we plant them on our dry sites and they do well for a while until they don't. So I encourage you to work with a professional to select trees, um, help you through that process. Of course, we know that storms and winds take out trees. Insects, particularly wood boring insects, ones that bore in and feed on that sugar rich cambium area, they cut off the flow of water and can kill a tree pretty quickly. Herbicides um, certainly can kill trees, although they're probably blamed for it uh, too often. Most of the licensed uh, applicators in yard settings, they know what they're doing, they have license. And, and so it's, it's, it's pretty rare, but it can happen. Uh, and then just competition from other trees, kill trees. I, I think of an example in a forest setting, red cedar comes back very rapidly into old fields and areas that were abandoned, but in time, because they're not tolerant to, to shade, other trees grow up around them and, and they die out through competition. So that's kind of the, the summary of that. And so what I'm going to do is give you a moment to um, write down um, what you see on this slide here. Here's the, the URL for the survey that certainly will assist me in future programs. And I would appreciate if you could take the time to fill that out. And then a more detailed publication actually exists on this that I developed about 15 years ago, Why Do Trees Die? And it's a long URL. You can just Google my name and that title, Why Do Trees Die, and you'll find it. Or you can write down the uh, URL if you want to, and I will give you a moment to write all this stuff down. Thank you for participating in Back Porch Forestry. Um, it's a joy to bring this to you and look forward to future sessions. Feel free to give me a contact if you have any questions. So I'll stop sharing this and we'll close out.